I didn't expect it to be that way. Uh, my name is Jamie Bradway, and I am the preservation librarian at NC State University Libraries, and hoping somebody will write a little response here and tell me if my volume's okay, um, if they can hear me. They, I don't know if you expected to see my face while looking at the conservation lab tour. Um, anyway, my name is Jamie Bradway. I've been uh, at the libraries since 2002, so almost 20 years. I've been a librarian here since 2007. And around that same time, the libraries finished a major renovation of the staff spaces in the library. Hi, hi Claire, hi Emily. Uh, that gave us a brand new uh, conservation lab. So I'm going to show you that. First, that's my water. These are some books. Um, here, I can actually... <laughs> uh, working with a gimbal here so that uh, it doesn't make people nauseous, but it's a little bit counterintuitive. This is our conservation space. Uh, some benches, some books, uh, some equipment. Um, I will show you this equipment, what it does, and I will show you um, some of the supplies and treatments that we also work on here in the lab. I'm going to start over here with the Jacques board shear um, because it was our workhorse for a few decades here. It's um, not much different from what you would have seen in a bookbinding space a couple hundred years ago. And uh, when I've looked at uh, we don't know the exact date of this piece of equipment, but when we've looked for something similar, the closest I've found to this model was from 1924. And it behaves sort of like that as well. And uh, we have kind of a love-hate relationship with it um, because it can't cut a straight line anymore. Uh, all these uh, little plastic bits here are shims to help kind of uh, make this blade straight. Um, and it has been sharpened and resharpened so many times that uh, we could no longer sharpen it and get a good cut on it. So, we got this just earlier this year, or sorry, late last year. Um, pandemic is all uh, one great big blur, of course. And you can see how little different it actually is. All right, so same thing. Same thing you would have had a couple hundred years ago, probably bookbinding has not changed that much. The technology, the engineering, the structures of it still hasn't changed that much. We do have a safety feature, so no conservation technicians will cut themselves on this blade. Not that anybody would ever do that. And uh, what else? It's green, it's beautiful, it makes a very straight cut, and we can measure and batch cut items, which we've been doing a lot lately because we've been doing a lot of bookbinding workshops for staff and for students, wellness days, things like that. You've seen some of them here on our Twitch stream. Yay for safety. Um, so this, uh, I, I should also say, this was partially funded by um, Preservation Endowments. Nancy Cavilla, Rob Madden, and several others helped uh, the lab become a safer, more efficient place with this equipment. Thank you very much. I would show you how to cut, but I don't know how, if I could do that with uh, one hand holding a camera and do so safely, <clears throat> which I think is important. We still have a card catalog. You know, most of us are fairly digital here, but we use our card catalog for all of our tools. And we find this to be a very good use. We have bone folders made out of sometimes actual bone, but not always. And Teflon folders made out of, I guess, Teflon. Sewing tapes, binders, knives. Here's where we keep all of our board and our paper and things like that. So this is binders board for when we're uh, making a brand new case for a book or replacing an old case. Pretty great, right? So organized, that's right. Um, so I should also say that um, this space is large and well-organized and, 
And that's mostly a product of the two people who work in here full time, or did in the before times, and probably will again someday. Um, and that is Robin Harper and Emily Schmidt. Emily's been here for almost as long as I have. Robin's been here for, what do you say, 10 years, Robin? Has it been more than that yet? Um, but they all do uh, kind of amazing things. And I'm just in here kind of partially. Oh, sneak peek of some more uh, job backers, things like that. So uh, binding takes a lot of space. 10 years is right. Great. Uh, binding takes up a lot of space because we are not only working with books, but we need uh, huge pieces of equipment. And to batch all of our material um, is a little complicated. This one that was renovated was also renovated for intending to house four staff. And we've had some staffing changes over the time, too. So right now we're just a two-person shop plus me occasionally. Um, I'm going to try and put this on the tripod for a second so I can demonstrate our power guillotine. Similar to our um, other board shears, except obviously it's power. And I have to put the camera down because there are safety features on this that require you to use two hands to chop. Um, this is going to be loud, so I'm going to stop talking for a second. So I think a lot of people are fairly pained uh, when they see the spine of a book chopped. Uh, uh, we are not so pained by it. I think we've become a little bit inured to it. Um, but also, it's just, for some bindings, a necessary uh, bit of destruction in order to kind of move forward from there. We would generally do this if we were going to do an adhesive bind on these books rather than try to recapture um, its original sewing or replicate a sewn book as it normally was. We do get, obviously, a lot of... Um, yeah, it's very smooth. We do get, obviously, a lot of adhesive binds as well. Um, modern binding. <clears throat> this makes me sound old and cantankerous, but modern binding is not as um, great as old binding. Look, look at all the things we have to measure with. And look, we even have a safety blade, right? So you can use that to cut a straight line and keep your fingers behind the bar. There's a, there's a reason we have that. <clears throat> and there are a couple people in the chat here that I think could explain it. Why? Uh, let's see. Um, this is our adhesive binder. And I didn't prepare a book for us, but... Um, and it's also hard to manage with one hand. It's maybe impossible to manage with one hand. So we uh, clamp a book down here and then can tighten it down. And we can use that to adhere our PVA to the spine of the book and put that in a nice rounder, if we want it to be rounded and backed, or flat, if we want it to be flat, which obviously a lot of adhesive bound books are flat. <clears throat> they come to us that way. Um, next, I'm going to show you a couple of our um, bo uh, book presses. We have one very, very large press that stands on the floor and takes very, very large books, and several uh, smaller books uh, that can, if we're batching products, uh, products, books, we can um, get maybe seven or eight books in a single press at a time. 
and that tends to be how uh, Emily and Robin do their work. They'll, if they're going to be doing a complete recase of a book, they'll do five or six at a time so they can break them all down at the same time. They can clean all of the spines at the same time. And then sew on new end sheets and get them rounded and backed in the job backer. And I'll show you that in just a minute. And then make the case. And if you um, do all those things in, in batches, it makes us a lot more efficient. I'm glad that you liked Cantankerous because that's a really apt description for me, uh, especially today for some reason, and I apologize if that comes across. So these are, oh, we had a little um, page advertising this event that features this job backer. And what a job backer is, uh, is an item that will clamp their book down so that we can help put it back into a healthy shape for, for casing in. Um, so over time, these books become flattened and uh, the pages kind of start to fall forward through gravity, through, um, through patrons who use the book on the photocopiers, right, and kind of press down on the spine to get a good connection with the glass. Um, and so they need to be re-sewn together and then reshaped as well. And if you see right here on the edge how you have these little folds over here, this is where the the book board would bump right into that, rest right up against that fold, and that keeps the book from uh, leaning forward in the future and falling out of that nice healthy shape. So that's what they're doing here. This is a sample that Emily was working on. So you see we don't have to re-sew the whole book when they come in and we try to repair them. Most of the damage that our our books receive are at this where the end sheets or the first signature kind of connects with the boards and so most of the time we just need to sew on new end sheets and we go in two or three signatures in order to make a really firm attachment to the tapes which are then glued into the new case and I can show you a little bit of that later too so you can see the stitches are linked around a tape and then they go back into the signature. The signature is each, is what we, <laughs> what's a signature, Jamie? Um, I was just about to say, a signature is also known as a choir, Q-U-I-R-E, or a section, if you're just basic. And that's what these, each of these little sections is a signature. It's a folded section of papers that you're going to sew through the fold. And the original binding used this little chain stitch, which we still do now, um, but we've added some main support, some extra support to this book. We try to make the binding as sympathetic as we can, if we can, because there's a reason we've bound books this way for hundreds of years. It's, um, it's very efficient and it's very strong binding. So here we have the next step of rounding and backing. So after that book printing lingo, oh, I love that, Colin, thanks. Um, so here's the next stage of that book binding, and that is um, we move some, we rub some wheat starch paste, usually wheat starch here, into these folds to give them a little bit stronger connection. And then we take a piece of this is called Japanese tissue, um, and uh, it's a paper made out of mulberry fibers. Really long, fibered, strong connection and a thin sheet of paper. And we use this to back the book. So we'll, we'll adhere it to the book. And then we'll put a piece of uh, crash or um, blanking on some words right now. It's not crash. It's Emily and Robin can stay in the chat. <clears throat> um, and we'll, we'll apply this over the top of that 
Japanese tissue stretch linen. Thanks, Robin. Uh, we'll apply this with a PVA, which is a more um, flexible, plasticized adhesive. But, and, and that's the result that you see here, is those layers being built up. This will also be adhered into the case. This will be adhered into the case. So we have a really strong connection between the text block, that's this, and the case. I don't have a good example of a case right now, except maybe over here. We use this as a sample a lot. So here's a sample book that we use to kind of teach a book structure. This is the case, the whole thing that wraps the text block. Text block. Uh, this is our uh, support linen or support tape that we sew around. Here's that, an example of that. Here's the um, Japanese tissue adhered with wheat starch paste. And here's the stretch linen or crash adhered over the top of that with PVA. So um, one of the reasons we do it this way is uh, there's a conservation ethic um, that tries to preserve as much of the original content and structure as possible. And what we're doing here is by having this layer come in contact with the original text with wheat starch paste only, we can remove all of this that we've done with a brush and some water. And then we have a kind of more artificial plasticized adhesive on top of that. And this doesn't come in contact with the original material over here so that we're not impacting negatively the book in the future. So there have been a few attempts at modernizing conservation science um, that decades down the road you find out, um, well, you find out there are negative impacts. Something as acidic, um, uh, you encapsulate something between two pieces of plastic and find out that it's off-gassing inside that sealed environment uh, that actually speeds up its degradation. Um, so those are, those are a couple examples of, of things that have been tried. And so what we try to do nowadays is make sure that everything we do is reversible. Um, obviously, when we look back at this poor guy, there are exceptions to what is reversible and what is not. Um, but we have to balance all that with um, being efficient in a high volume um, environment in which patrons need things or need things now. Um, Uh, I mentioned encapsulating. I should show you that too. Encapsulating is when we take a couple pieces of mylar, almost always mylar in our case, um, and put it around a piece of paper. So our special collections will sometimes have a single manuscript item, um, and it, is, it has no protection. Um, Oh, you know what? Does the other side of that book show the end sheets glued down? I think it does. I'll go back to it in just a second. I'm going to show how this works first. So we have the ability to encapsulate items with power of sound. That's right. This is a sonic. Oh, you know what? I left my key over in the gear. Sorry about that, this is a sonic welder. And what you're about to hear is a maintenance problem. It's not the sound that is actually fusing these two pieces of mylar together. See that sound? You hear that sound? That's the need for uh, lubrication, I think, on the engine. Again, with everything in place. Let's 
Good question. I believe it's welded, Colin. So can this, can you see how strong that bond is? And so then we would do all four sides, have, have our cute little artifact in the middle there, which I should have thought of putting a cute little artifact in there. Robin asked if this model uh, showed what that adhesive looks like on the back side of this book, and it does. So here's the kind of breakdown version of it. And here's what it looks like when it's all glued in. So you can kind of see if there's enough shadow there. You can see where the tapes are underneath there. So there's that long stretch of linen, and here's each piece of linen tape underneath that. And here are our two sheets of and sheet paper that have been folded and sewn into the item. And you can see how it connects to the original text block. Oh man, Emily and Robin aren't here right now. I could be doing something more with their material. Um, yeah, please do give me some ideas, Colin. So here is a typical kind of workload for the lab, or um, what was fairly typical in the before times. It's a little bit different now. Emily and Robin both do um, some fine kind of hand binding and journal work outside of their work here in the library. So uh, they both, as a result, had a sort of conservation lab at home if they wanted, and for the last year they've been working a lot from home. Um, some of the things they need to do here, like if you're trying to do a bunch of batch work, cutting a bunch of boards on a board shear is a lot easier than trying to cut it with a scalpel at home, which hopefully they're not trying to cut it with scalpels at home. You're not trying to cut it with scalpels at home, right? Uh, uh, we do sometimes um, have to ILL and photocopy uh, pages for replacements. That's obviously something that's easier to done here. Um, uh, I don't know what their setup is for um, pressing books afterward with the adhesives that are involved. It's kind of necessary to have them under weight for a good while after they're glued up. So our most typical deal is, shout out to ILL, woo! Um, and you see this all the time because uh, as nicely as I can, uh, people don't know how to take a book off of a shelf. So they grab the top of a book on the library shelf and they go, whoop, and they pull it down. And so most of the damage that we see is the top of the spine of the book, What you should be doing, by the way. It's hard to do with the back here. It's pushing in the two books on the surrounding side and then pulling a book out like this from the shelf, right? That way you, <laughs> that way you have a, a good solid grasp on the item. Uh, also from, this is probably more from bouncing around in backpacks and um, being spread out on uh, a scanner or a copy machine. We get a lot of, uh, tears on the sides of the spine as well. So we can do a full recase on those, or we could also just do a spine repair, um, where, we, where everything else is intact on the book. The sewing's in good condition. The boards are in good condition. So we just need a new spine on the item, and we often do that. Sometimes we cut out a piece. If there's something particularly decorative, um, we can cut out the original spine and glue that over the top of a stronger material so we have a good solid join between the boards and the spine. Um, one thing I don't see on this particular cart is leather bound items, um, which we, we certainly have a lot in the stacks and in special collections, but that's a little bit more complicated for us to handle. Um, 
leather bindings are really beautiful and really horrible um, items to uh, for longevity of a book, right? Something that's going to be used as much as we hope things are used here, right? The goal is to find items that are extremely useful to our researchers here and that they need to use them a lot because we picked the right items. If it's a leather item, we only get a couple uses out of it before we have to rebind it. I'll show you our shelves here in a second. <clears throat> Sorry for our rough transitions. <clears throat> Leather is evil, Robin. You're right. Um, so here's a good example of our shelves. A lot of things are going to be rebacked or have some spine repair. Hello, book friends. Remember these? Back in the olden days? Lots of spine repair. Here we have a shelf called Bindery Prep. We are in a bindery, right? Uh, well, we are, yeah, I suppose, but there's also a much higher um, density, uh, quicker turnaround, slightly rougher process uh, bindery in Greensboro that we send a lot of materials to that tend to be really strong and um, perhaps aren't as high use or in part of our core collections and so we'll send those out for a quick repair at that bindery and keep the things that are more valuable or need a quicker turnaround or meet certain researcher needs uh, we'll do those here in the lab um, here are those full read cases that i described with that little cutaway book so we'll do a whole bunch of those here's a nice leather binding from 1881. Um, I know very little about this book, but I do know that when it leaves this lab, it will not be in a leather binding anymore. I hope you all feel okay about that. Um, what I'm describing to you here are our circulating collections. We have very different approaches to um, the special collections here in the library. Um, quick Covers is a um, sort of, I, I don't know how to describe a quick cover. Uh, it is an abbreviated repair for things that need to get right back out again. Often this is something that is on reserves in the library. And um, so there's expected to be a higher need by a class that's currently in session. Here are those adhesive binds that will start with the chopping of the spine over on the power guillotine before we make a new case and glue them in. More quick covers. We don't currently have any PAM binding to do, which is unusual, but we often have um, like a magazine that is a single section of pages that we then um, uh, staple into a pamphlet and they'll live on the shelf that way. I mentioned that commercial bindery that we send things to where, where we have the bindery prep. This is what will come back from them. So it's very cool that we have the, I feel like there needs to be an encapsulated PBJ on that shelf. I don't think encapsulating it would um, keep it from being a danger like uh, keeping bugs away or mold away or anything like that. And we do have a very strict food policy in the lab. <clears throat> so if we encapsulated it, it would have to live in Colin's desk or something like that. So uh, this, if you use uh, bound journals or something in the library, this is what typically you'll see, uh, except obviously most of those are much bigger. It's very much uh, the same kind of structure, except they chop the spine and adhere it all in. Oh my gosh, Colin. I just went to your desk. I regret it. This is also a common kind of problem we have. I described the um, spine damage that occurs. Sometimes the spines are completely missing, sometimes. The cases are completely missing, and we get half of a book. Sometimes a faculty member will have a book that belongs to the library 
for a little bit too long and they'll forget it isn't theirs. And they'll uh, adhere some little tabs in to mark their place and highlight it. Uh, this is one of my favorite books, actually. It was deemed irreparable and we purchased a replacement, but I had to keep it for our um, shelf of horrors. Yeah, me too, Robin. Um, I mentioned our special collections items. I should say something more about that. Some of you might recognize this as a gun safe. I don't believe there are many of these on campus, and it probably raised some eyes, some eyebrows when we tried to purchase it, when we did purchase it. And this is some of our special collections material that we have in the lab right now, and we keep locked in the safe when it's here um, as a secure environment for more valuable items. We have the ability to keep notes. And um, for those special collections items, we are um, we do much less invasive repair work. So we could considerably strengthen the structure of a special collections or rare item and considerably decrease its value at the same time because of that because of that change in structure and removing some of the history and the provenance of the item, right? So all the damage that you see to an item, all the wear and tear, that's part of its history and where it's been. And so for special collections researchers, they want to see that. Um, it's obviously very important. Um, so that is, not, that is not what we do for special collections material. Most of the special collections material gets um, boxed we do some um, minor repair work on their items, um, but again, in such a fashion that could be easily reversed if it turns out wheat starch paste is the worst thing in the world, um, which I don't believe they'll find that out, but they'll be able to remove that later. Sorry if this was addressed earlier. Um, yeah, so this is great. Um, so do we identify damage as the books are borrowed and returned, or do you just look for damaged books in the stacks? Um, that is a great question, and a question we field fairly often. So all the material that is here in the lab, um, ideally, is material that has just circulated. Um, we have approximately 4 million volumes in the library. And we could probably go up onto the sixth floor, maybe seventh floor, and walk up and down the stacks and find ourselves a year's worth of work. <clears throat> but the concern is um, we'll be spending our energy on items that haven't circulated since 1995 or, you know, name a date. And as a result, not spend time working on materials that are currently useful to current researchers right here on campus. So it is driven by demand, and the reason for that is we want to make sure we're working on relevant material. Um, I do, so I often think one of the things, I am a librarian, and one of the things about this, I don't, I don't see patrons day to day to help them with their research questions. I think of us as helping the patrons of the future. So in 2045, a researcher is going to need one of these 200 books. And if we're not here, um, they're not going to be able to have that item. So we're trying to make sure that, that we have a healthy collection as kind of asset management, as um, researcher needs, and uh, the best way to do that is to focus on what is currently relevant rather than what was once relevant or once expected to be um, relevant. You know, we don't, we haven't 100% of the time purchased items that were um, suiting the needs of our researchers. Some of those are up in the stacks and some of them just haven't found their need yet. <clears throat> Speaking of special collections, 
A uh, big driver for us the last few years has been our collecting, their collecting, Special Collections collecting, of architectural drawings. Um, Mid-century modern drawings, drawings from all over the southeast. Um, so we have an awful lot of drawings, and it's a constant workflow to manage their storage and get them into a state in which they can be um, scanned if we're going to digitize them. And one of the things we do is humidify and flatten them. This is often, uh, or this used to be something that I considered embarrassing. We do a lot of tours of the lab. <laughs> That's sonically sealed. Uh, rarely uh, do we sonically seal these. They're huge, and um, that adds a lot of bulk, and we don't have that much storage. <clears throat> so it used to embarrass me that we used recycling bins uh, as a conservation treatment, but I've since found that the more professional uses do the exact same thing, but just look different. <clears throat> and I'm not much about the aesthetics. So um, we will fill the bottom of this with water. We have a, one bin that is full of weight. Did it just flip upside down? Sorry about that. <laughs> uh, full of weight. And then we take another bin full of drawings. So they're not actually sitting in the water. And then we put this case on top of it and we'll get a humid environment for about 24 to 48 hours. That's about between 95 and 99% relative humidity. And they become limp. And then we put them under weight with uh, pieces of reme and blotter paper and occasionally some felt. Felt like this to kind of spread out the, the weight a little bit more evenly. And we leave those under weight for a couple of weeks and then we have a nice flat item at the end. And it's kind of magical. Another thing we often do, uh, well, another thing that's in our purview, I will say, that uh, we don't do very often because we don't change exhibits, exhibits a lot, is the preparation for exhibit pieces, artifacts that are going to go into the cases upstairs uh, for six months or however long an exhibit's planned. And so um, I have to show these because I'm immensely proud of them. We um, cut and fold this acrylic product here, sometimes using heat, sometimes just using brute force, um, you know, clamped down in the job backers over there. And I've never really made something so cute and dainty before to, to show off some of our artifacts. Um, this is a similar deal, built a kind of complicated cradle so that we could show a magazine on one side and a photo on the other. This is for an exhibit that's going in the case right now, so this counts as a sneak peek of the 100th year of the technician. Um, exhibits librarian can tell us, you know, what kind of angle they want an item to be presented at, um, and we'll go ahead and, you know, match whatever they need for some, sometimes it's ADA compliance, sometimes it's because it's in an awkward place surrounded by a whole bunch of other artifacts. This is another one that I'm kind of proud of because I've never achieved a fold quite this extreme before. But this is currently covered with a film that protects the acrylic while we're folding it. So it will look much glossier and prettier once it's into the, once it's into the cases. As I'm getting older and my wrists can't handle this as much, I have discovered that acrylic and heat respond pretty well together. And uh, I can do folds that I didn't used to be able to manage, which is very neat. Uh, I think Emily moved this stuff over here to clean up the lab, but we have some old, um, uh, mostly uh, cereal collections that are embrittled but also exist online, and so that's more likely how our researchers will access it. So what we're going to do with them, um, we're not going to chuck them, obviously. We're going to um, not quite encapsulate, more like a shrink wrap, like you're going to get a gift basket. Um, these are gift baskets of, of brittle bound materials. 
And so we'll do that soon. I also had, oh, Emily, when you clean up the lab, there was a piece of cardboard here. This is a crimper. And so we make a lot of boxes I mentioned. And um, I'm sorry, Emily, I don't think you did that. I think I did it after practicing crimping uh, too many times on a single small piece of blue corrugated board. I threw it away. Um, so we can uh, help make our folds here um, and make these really, really clever boxes. Um, I keep saying we as if I'm the one doing this work. It's all Emily and Robin. Um, running out of things. Here's our book cloth. Look at the amount of choices we have. We try to... Um, so every once in a while we'll be binding something that's part of a series, and people know that series as the, uh, the bunch of red books that were over in that corner. And so when we're rebinding one of those items and can't salvage the original case, we do try to match find a sympathetic color, sympathetic texture um, to those cloths and redo them. <clears throat> Got some more over here. Look at all the colors we have. And it's a lot of trial and error and sometimes the colors come and go and you know, they run out of fashion. What am I missing? Um, I did kind of expect that I would be answering more questions, but it's also hard to follow along in the chat. Do, do, do. Anybody got some questions for me? I'm going to sit still for a minute and just look at the chat. Interesting. So we have hardcore durable machinery and somewhat fragile books. Yeah, it is serious. I mean, we, there is a big contrast between, like these materials seem so delicate and that they, and yet they last centuries. <clears throat> and there's a, like we can, everything that's been bound since the mid seventies has been on this really good uh, quality acid-free paper. Not everything, newspapers haven't been, but most, major publishers have been using really quality paper and it's hard to find like paper to fill your copy machine that isn't acid free and pretty high quality stuff and that all came about because for about a hundred years we had really horrible paper and the government printing office kind of demanded which is one of the biggest publishers demanded more a higher quality paper and so everybody started using higher quality paper but it all kind of went wrong when we started using wood pulp paper that had a lot of lignin, which created a lot of acids and didn't last very long. So you look at materials that were bound from the late 1800s to 1975 or so, and they're not going to last very long. Um, they're, they're really in horrible condition. And then everything from kind of the middle of the 19th century earlier is still in really good condition because it was great quality paper with no acid. It had a kind of a high um, con cotton or fiber content. Um, and the only thing wrong with them is the leather bindings, which I'm, I'm, I can't get worked up over uh, the bindings, right? That's the, um, we're, we're delivering ideas here of somebody who wrote a thing and um, I think the person who wrote that thing or had some ideas to present usually didn't care much about the package that it was delivered in. They just wanted their ideas out there. And so I'm worried about those ideas, um, or concerned about them, I'm not worried about them, and trying to make sure they get carried forward. And so we can do that for centuries, and then for a century not, and then from here forward, we're all good. Um, I have a couple questions now. So how often do you do tours in the before times? Um, so I'd say we'd probably do a tour a month, maybe more. And it's kind of weird, like new staff go on tours, right? They see the whole library. I have a five minute spiel for them. Um, we have um, folks come from visiting 
institutions to see what our library is doing. I've got a 15 minute spiel for them and they like to see what we're doing. I do the same thing when I go visit other libraries. I want to see their conservation labs and see what they do differently or what they do the same. Um, and then we have friends of the library in here occasionally. Um, at least once a year now we're part of their events where I told you we have a very strict um, food policy, food and drink policy in here. Well, during those events there has been food and wine in the lab. And I've kind of been okay about it because it's fun to have people in here and show off what we do. Um, in the current times, instead of the before times, we haven't really done much. We haven't, this is our first tour of the lab, but we have done a lot of workshops for students um, and staff. And we've worked with some of the professors who want to get their students involved in critical making, understanding how objects work and how they're engineered. And I think a book is a great way to show that. Um, what got me interested in conservation? Um, I've always worked with my hands. I, um, uh, the cliche, always loved books. I do love books and um, uh, I kind of fell into this work. Uh, I worked in bookstores. I managed uh, sections of a university bookstore in Montana where I went to school and came here hoping to do something similar. Couldn't find it, and I figured the library would be similar enough. It is not similar at all, but um, it was a good kind of combination of my hand skills and interests, and I kind of fell in love with it. I. Uh, don't want to speak too much for the others, but I know Emily started working as a student at UNC in their library's conservation lab and developed the skills necessary to turn that into a career. And she started working here right out of college and still does that. Robin has worked other places before coming here. I can't speak as to what got either of them interested in conservation per se, but I just know that they've worked really hard to build their hand skills and are really impressive. whisper the link to us, you can put it in the chat. Best job ever. And seriously, the best co-workers ever, too. Um, so, yeah, uh, we, the three of us found the right, uh, right place to be, I think. Um, what are our other questions? I haven't been following the chat very uh, thoroughly because I'm, I'm talking and walking around. Um, but Emily and Robin obviously are in the chat, and hopefully they've been answering your questions as they come along. Um, I also wanted to say that we have been talking, uh, the three of us, about doing some more of these Twitch streams of demonstrations, not necessarily teaching people how to do bookbinding, but demonstrating what it is that we're doing in the lab. So I sort of set this up as um, an introduction to conservation in the libraries and thinking that we'll do something more in depth in the future. Um, what is the oldest, most valuable example you've worked on? Um, we do have some, in our special collections, we have some very old, I think 15th century, I, I hope, it would be great if there's somebody from SCRC on here, but I think there's been a 15th century vellum sheet that we encapsulated here and built a nice box for. Um, you can include a picture of the ancient beans. Oh, jeez. Um, that's right, I forgot about the beans. Uh, we've, we've, done, we've done a lot of oddities with them, so... Uh, one of my favorite things is the oddly shaped um, hard things to make a box for and kind of carving in foam and then building a box for these items. A few years ago, we um, built a box for um, it was Dr. Harrelson's wife's gown. 
and I can't remember what she wore this to, but there's this beautiful gown in special collections that belonged to the first chancellor's wife. And we had to build a box for that and protect its um, uh, kind of hoop from collapsing in on itself. And we had a really cool, um, uh, yeah, there's just the three dimensional things that are complicated. Those are my favorites, I think. I don't do much of the book repair anymore. So I, I take those little joys where I can find them. I don't know if we know that they're magic. Robin, do you remember anything about the beans? Oh, architectural model boxes, sure. I wish we had some of those here. So I told you they're doing a lot of collection um, architectural collections um, from the South, especially kind of in the 50s and 60s. And we have some great, great models of mid-century modern architecture here and building the boxes and structures for those to keep them safe. Um, and those are over at our, um, what do they call it? Uh, ASX, Administrative Services Annex. We have a, a facility that houses a bunch of kind of special collections, oddities, um, and old collections over there. Uh, questions uncovered. What are your future hopes for the conservation space community? Do you care more about the object or the information in the object? Um, I'm going to take the second question first. It comes from Robin, so it feels kind of like a plant. Um, but I'm much more interested in the information inside the object than I am about the object itself. Um, uh, we're, we're about protecting those ideas and that content much more than, than we are about the artifact, artifactual value of most of the collections here. Um, and to get precious about the object um, I think would be a disservice to the amount and the value, the value of that material, right? So right now, if we take the approach that we're currently taking, we can make a much bigger impact on the health of the collection than if we got precious about single objects, um, spending 40 hours on a single item so it remains, you know, perfectly, uh, a perfect replica of how it was bound. Um, I don't think that would be a good use of our time, and um, I believe researchers at NC State in the future would agree with that, so that's what we try to do. Um, the other question, um, hopes for the conservation space and community, um, is a much more complicated question. So. Um, we've obviously seen a, a decrease in circulation of print materials over the years. And um, that makes sense. I, I tend to do most of my reading digitally as well. Um, so uh, that, that is a concern for people in the conservation space and conservation community that um, the work has kind of decreased. so far that hasn't terribly impacted us, right? There's, we talked about walking up on the seventh floor and finding a year's worth of work that's still there. And what we're discovering now is that there are a lot of collections that were not used the way a typical collection is. Um, you know, they tend, tend not to leave the building. They tend to be referenced from the shelf and put back on the shelf and we never see them down in the conservation space. Uh, so we need to find those that are currently relevant to researchers and work on those. And I think that's almost a career's worth of work when you look at four million volumes. Um, but on a larger picture, um, so take what's happening in our lab with its lack uh, or its lowered circulation rate and magnify that by dozens to a hundred and you're looking at what that commercial bindery is dealing with that we send a lot of materials to. And I worry more about 
that level of large commercial conservation and, and what's going to be happening in their future? And how are we going to react in this conservation space if we no longer have an outlet for that kind of material? So there is also the potential that we will have a large influx of repair in the near future, kind of five to 10 years out um, that, that I think we need to be prepared for and we need to be training new staff for. Um, I don't know, we also do a lot of work with digital preservation. Um, I'm not going to show you my office, but we have built a scanner over there. Um, and we do a lot of digitization work here, and it's a big driver for the lab too. We're digitizing material, but we're not chucking the paper when we're done with that. And through that digitization process, we are finding a lot of material that is damaged or um, needs some attention from the conservation lab. So that's another big driver for our future. And special collections material needs a lot of help too. We're still collecting the papers of retired faculty, retiring faculty, and um, major architects and landscape architects who are nearing the end of their career, uh, that their, their life's work needs attention and a place. And conservation has a major role to play in that. I don't know. In the before times or the after times, do you hire student workers? We have had student workers and um, it's, but it's been a while. We have a paper science engineering program here on campus, and I think it would be interesting to partner with them and get some students experience with old paper. Um, and we've tried that a couple times and found that most of them are interested in new paper, <laughs> not old paper. Um, and it also takes a lot of, um, investment to get somebody trained to do this work to get into a productive role in the lab. That's not saying we shouldn't do it, but it's hard to get a senior undergraduate in here and teach them a lot of repair work and then have them graduate. And we've experienced that a few times too. Um, so I don't know what our plans are for student workers in the future. I expect um, we will have them again someday, but I don't know what I don't know when that day is right now Student workers are incredible definitely The library couldn't function without them Do I judge a book by its cover almost certainly when I'm shopping I judge a book by its cover and um, That's almost always a mistake, but there's just some part of me that says, you know, if you can't invest in a decent design for your cover, do you really have something important to say? The answer is usually yes, but still, I get suckered. We've been going for about an hour, so if there aren't any other questions, I think I'm gonna log off. Two. It was really good seeing y'all. Thanks for attending. And uh, stay tuned on the uh, NCSU Library's Twitch page for more conservation work hopefully ahead. Thanks all. Bye.